Mastermind, Strategist for Hire, written by Clouds, my head in the clouds not coming down, and read by Eleanor Elizabeth. Chapter 34. Upbringing. Hisashi Midoriya let out a breath of smoke as he watched the news. So, Jiren was dead, huh? It was probably for the best. He hadn't been quite the same since his abduction. It was time to get some new faces in the brokering business anyway. On a more personal note, now that Jiren was out of the way, there was nothing holding Hazashi back from meeting with Mastermind. He'd been in the villain game long enough to have gained a fearsome reputation, and Mastermind wasn't known for being picky about his clients. So Hazashi had no doubt that the one he'd somehow offended was Jiren, not Mastermind. Still, it wouldn't have been wise to go behind the broker's back, but that wouldn't be a problem anymore. Hisashi called out to one of his underlings. I need you to find out what meetings Mastermind has coming up. He grinned. I think it's time we reach out, don't you? I seriously don't know how you can eat that stuff. Darby wrinkled his nose in disgust as Keiko destroyed yet another chicken wing. You're eating them too, Kiko said, not bothering to cover his mouth. If Darby was already disgusted, why waste the extra effort? Well, I'm not. Darby gestured to his wings, and Kigo rolled his eyes. What, did you think actual hawks only eat mice or worms or something? Newsflash! Kigo took another bite. They eat birds, so I can eat all the fried chicken I want, okay? Darby shook his head and went back to his own plate. Kigo didn't know exactly why Darby had invited him over for takeout and video games, but he said it was something about building trust. Kigo wasn't complaining. Any time he spent with the League was an opportunity to gather more information on how they worked and what they might do next. He personally had been hoping to spend more time with the other members of the League today as well, but so far it was just him and Darby. Freezer Burn was apparently on a date with Mastermind, and Kigo couldn't help but be a little disappointed he hadn't arrived on time to see Mastermind's unmasked face. Maybe Darby just invited him over so he wouldn't have to be alone? Did villains get lonely? So, Birdie. Darby said finally. What was it like growing up with the Hero Commission? Kigo froze. What? I mean, sorry if I'm overstepping my boundaries. Darby held up his hands placatingly, but Mastermind let slip about, well, your upbringing, I guess. Sorry if that's something you're not comfortable discussing, or just forget I said anything. Kigo blinked a few times. On the one hand, the fact that he was raised by the Hero Commission was classified info, on the other hand, he might be able to use it to cement his place in the League. Maybe if he could give himself a convincing enough backstory, Darby would finally believe that he was an ally, not an infiltrator. It's okay, man. Kigo smiled. I don't mind. Ask away. Darby nodded. How old were you when they picked you up? There really wasn't any way of knowing how much Mastermind knew, or how much she'd told the League, so honesty was probably the best policy for now if Kigo really wanted this to work. I think I was, like, seven or eight. It was a few years after I got my quack. My parents weren't really around a lot, and when they were, they were drunk, so I spent a lot of time either alone or with my friends, playing and messing around with our quacks. So you had a powerful quirk and knew how to use it, Darby said. Sounds to me like the perfect combination for the commission to take advantage of. Kigo nodded, because that's what Darby expected, but that's not what the commission had been thinking when they took him in, was it? So, um, anyway, yeah. I ended up saving a bunch of people from a car accident, and when the heroes arrived, well... Kego frowned. I don't really remember exactly. It was a long time ago. But these guys in suits went to talk to my parents, and told them they'd make sure I had a good life, away from the poverty. Darby scoffed. I'm sure they offered your parents a pretty comfortable life too, right? Kego looked at him in confusion. What do you mean? Darby stared at him for a moment. You really expect me to believe the Commission didn't give those bastards anything to take you away, or stay silent about the whole thing? He shook his head. Let's be honest, Birdie. Your parents probably sold you to the Commission for a six-pack of beer. Kigo sputtered for a minute. The Commission hadn't bought him. That was wrong. Illegal. That was... Exactly what Endeavour had done to get his hands on Darby's mother. Thinking about it, it was kind of odd that his parents had never said anything about the whole thing, wasn't it? 
Wouldn't a mum and dad who thought they were giving him his best chance at life, like the commission told him, wouldn't they step forward when he became a hero? Wouldn't they brag to their friends when he rose up in the ranks and became number one? How much had the commission paid them for their silence? Darby was looking at him sympathetically. I guess you hadn't figured that part out yet, had you? He awkwardly put his hand on Hugo's shoulder. Don't worry about it, Bertie. These bastards at the commission never deserved you anyway. I'm guessing they trained you relentlessly, like Endeavor trained me and Shoto. Kogo nodded numbly, then remembered he was supposed to be playing this up to get Darby to trust him. Yeah, actually. I basically trained every day, practicing strength and control with my feathers. They even made me hit targets blindfolded until I didn't have any feathers left to use. They said using all my feathers like that would help me both with my control and how fast they grew back in. Darby raised an eyebrow. Did it? Kigo shrugged. I don't know. I mean, it definitely helped with my control, but I'd never really used all my feathers at once before the commission took me away, so I don't really know if it made them grow any faster. Darby nodded. Makes sense. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Kigo didn't really know how to react to that. No one had ever pitied him for his upbringing before. The commission always just told him how lucky he was that they'd found him as early as they did. So, which was it? Did he have a blessed upbringing? Or was he bought and raised to, what, be the commission's personal weapon? Don't worry about it, man, Kigo said finally. I mean, it made me who I am now, right? Dobby frowned. Doesn't mean it didn't suck. He sighed and gestured to his scars. I mean... These scars look pretty badass and add to my aesthetic, but it doesn't mean getting them didn't hurt. Kigo studied the burn scars for a moment, his stomach sinking as he connected the dots. Did... did Endeavour give you those? Dobby chuckled. It wasn't his fire that burnt me, if that's what you mean, but it was still the bastard's fault. He paused and frowned. I may have been born with my father's fire quirk, but my mom was an ice user. Shoto got lucky with his perfect quirk. As long as he uses both sides, his quirk won't hurt him. Me, however. Darby ran a hand along his collarbone, fingering where his scars attached to the flawless skin on his chest. I was born with the skin of an ice user. Every time I used my quirk as a kid, it hurt, and I risked burning myself beyond repair. One day, after my mom got sent away, Shoto was being stubborn, so Dad decided to train me instead. He took a deep breath. He pushed me too far. He was angry and frustrated and just kept attacking me, even though he could see how much pain I was in. I seriously thought I was going to die. So, I did what I had to to survive, and I went beyond my limits. Kiko watched as Darby clenched his fists, seeing the way his skin, scars, and staples stretched. The scars. That was just Darby. Kigo had never thought about how he'd gotten them, how much it must have hurt. Why was that? Was it just because he was a villain? Did that really make Darby's pain any less than his own for some reason? Darby exhaled slowly. Anyway, I ran away not too long after that. My scars are probably only as bad as they are because I didn't really have access to a hospital while they finished healing, but whatever. Darby shrugged. The good thing is that I ended up killing a bunch of my nerve endings, so using my quirk doesn't hurt nearly as much as it did when I was a kid. I don't think that counts as a good thing, Kigo said, slightly horrified. Dobby laughed. <laughs> yeah, but it sure as hell makes torching things a lot easier. Kigo shook his head. You're insane. Yeah, yeah, never said I wasn't, but whatever. Dobby grinned. But seriously, Hawks. If you ever want out of the commission, we'd be happy to help. I mean, it'd be great if you were spying for us instead of for them, but if you ever just went out, no one should have to do something they're uncomfortable with. Kago stared at him for a moment. So much for convincing Darby he wasn't a spy. And he didn't need to be freed from the Hero Commission. Did he? Sure, man, whatever. Kago smiled, hoping it was convincing enough but weren't you supposed to be destroying me in video games? Chapter 35 Date Night For the record, 
Shoto only brought up the whole let's go see the All Might Memorial movie in full villain garb thing as a joke, but Izuku would laugh so hard he'd chop grape soda out of his nose and, well, disturbing the peace was kind of in the job description, wasn't it? So, anyway, Shoto was seriously questioning all of his life choices as he watched people literally dive to get out of their way as they walked into the movie theatre holding hands. So, Shoto, do you want to buy the tickets and I'll get the popcorn? Shoto couldn't help but burst out laughing. Do you really think they're going to make us pay? Izuka's eyes sparkled with amusement. I mean, probably not, but your whole thing is more of a vigilante, only hurting people who deserve it type attitude. Besides, it'll be hilarious to see how confused everyone gets. Shoto chuckled. All right, I guess I'll get the tickets then. Izuku practically bounced with excitement. Perfect. Meet me back here? Shoto nodded, and Izuku ran around the corner to the concession stand. Shoto strode confidently up to the ticket counter, and smiled at the trembling assistant. Two tickets to All Might's symbol of peace, please. The attendant stared at him for a long minute, but jumped into action when Shoto raised an eyebrow at him. He typed a few things into the register in front of him and printed the tickets, quickly handing them to Shoto. How much? What? The attendant's voice was practically a squeak as he stared at Shoto in shock. Shoto rolled his eyes and pulled some cash from his wallet. How much do I owe you for the tickets? I'm an upstanding citizen, after all. I'm not here to rob you. He laughed at the irony. The media would have a field day trying to figure that one out. Um, 3,600 yen? Mina and Kirishima both groaned as the movie all of a sudden stopped and the lights turned on. But they weren't the only ones. Most of Class 1A looked annoyed as well. Come on, Mina said. We never get permission to leave the dorms. Just let us have our fun. Yayorozu shook her head. I'm sure they must have a good reason for stopping the movie. Maybe there's a villain attack nearby and we have to evacuate. Ida stood. If that is the case, did everyone remember to bring their provisional licenses? If we need to assist the pros, we will need to do so legally. Yes, Ida, we all have our licenses. Shinzo rolled his eyes. Or did you forget Aizawa checked them all before we left? We wouldn't have been allowed to leave UA if we didn't have them. It still kind of sucks Bakugo has to go through anger management therapy before they'll give him his, Kirishima sighed. Yeah, well, they can't risk any other heroes going Endeavor, Kaminari said. That'd suck. Could I have everyone's attention, please? A nervous-looking usher raised her voice and the theatre went quiet. They better have a good reason for stopping the movie. Sarah grumbled. Shh! Uraraka glared at him. Um, the villains, Mastermind and Freezer Burn have been spotted in the theatre. We are going to evacuate out of the back door. If everyone could please calmly follow me. The theatre emptied quickly as people rushed to the emergency exits. The members of Class 1A looked at each other. Shinzo stood and headed for the doors that led to the lobby. Shinzo! Ida called. What are you doing? We're heroes, Shinzo said. And they're villains. It seems pretty simple to me. Wait, Yayurozu said. We aren't authorised to capture Mastermind. We could just make things worse. Then we won't catch Mastermind, Kirishima said. But what Todoroki did definitely wasn't manly at all. There were nods all around, and Yayurozu sighed. All right, but let's be careful about this. We all know how powerful Todoroki is, and we can't forget that Mastermind is with him. They rushed out into the lobby and saw Todoroki leaning against the ticket counter like he didn't have a care in the world, but Mastermind was nowhere to be seen. A slight commotion caught Shinzo's attention, and he turned to see all of Class 1A coming out from the theatre area in their casual clothes. Huh. They must have been let out the dorms for a night of fun. Bad timing. He scanned his classmates' faces, ignoring the hurt, betrayal and anger he saw there. They'd ignored his pain, hadn't they? He smiled cheekily at them. Hey guys, are you all here to see the All Might movie too? Uraraka was practically growling at him, but nobody made a move. Yet. So, where's your boyfriend? Kaminari asked. Shoto tilted his head. Word must travel fast, considering this was his and Azuku's first date in public. You mean mastermind? What? No! To his surprise, Kaminari looked confused. But then again, maybe he shouldn't have been surprised. 
This was Kaminari, after all. Isn't Darby your boyfriend? Everyone stopped glaring at Shoto to gape at Kaminari in disbelief. Shoto's nose crinkled in disgust. Ew, no. Darby's my brother. You idiot. Just no. Jiro hit Kaminari in the eye with one of her ear jacks. How did even you miss that, you idiot? I don't know, Kaminari said. I just, I guess I wasn't paying attention. You know how I get when I go over my wattage limit. Wait, Ashido said. Does that mean Mastermind is your boyfriend? Shoto chuckled. Why else did you think we were here? We're on a date. We thought it'd be funny to go see the All Might movie. Don't you agree? You bastard! Ida ran at him full speed, but Shoto simply froze the floor so he'd slip and fall, freezing the rest of the class to the floor while he was at it. Does this mean we're not going to be able to watch the movie? He pouted. We were looking forward to it. You sick! Sato glared at him. Isn't it bad enough you joined the guys that killed him? Now you have to mock his memory too? Shoto returned his glare. All Might wasn't a hero. A real hero wouldn't have been too blind to see what was right underneath his nose. And I'm not even the only one All Might could have saved, could have given hope, but chose to crush instead. Oh, and who else is that? Shinzo asked. Shoto opened his mouth to answer, then slammed his jaw shut again, making Shinzo curse. All of a sudden, he was knocked off balance by Dark Shadow, who obviously hadn't been frozen to the ground like his classmates. He rolled to his feet, only to receive a hardened punch from Kirishima, who had managed to break through his ice. Sato broke the ice trapping him soon after, and joined in the assault. Shoto lit up his left side to keep them at bay and disable Dark Shadow, but that meant the others broke their ice that much easier. He dodged as Ashido skated by him and threw up an ice wall to block her acid attack, then had to shield his eyes as Yaoyurozu threw one of her flashbang dolls at him, giving Kirishima another opening to punch him again. Stop. Shoto blinked his eyes open to see his classmates frozen, staring at Izuku, who had one of his knives at the throat of a terrified concessions attendant. He shifted the knife slightly, making a drop of blood slowly roll down the attendant's neck. Move again, and she dies. Izuku growled, then glanced at Shinzo. Same goes for you if you speak. Nod if you understand. There was a round of nods of his classmates, none of which looked happy about it as they refused to take their eyes off Izuku's knife. His hostage whimpered slightly as Izuku chuckled. Right answer. Good to know you haven't forgotten the first rule of hero work. Come on, Shoto. It's time for us to go. He stepped forward, dragging the hostage roughly along with them. She's coming with us. If you all stay put like good little heroes, we'll let her go in a few blocks. Shoto followed Izuku to the door, feeling the frustration of his classmates as he left them behind. Why? Shoto glanced back to see tears in Yayurosa's eyes, and she looked at him imploringly. Why, Todoroki? Why did you do it? Ozuku stopped, letting Shoto take his time. He knew if he were to just walk away right now, Ozuku wouldn't think any less of him, but he was leaving that up to Shoto. It was sweet. Shoto took a deep breath, and looked Yaoyurozu in the eye. Because this is what it takes to be free. Then he and Izuku walked out of the door. They'd have to find something else to do for their date. Chapter 37 Dragon All right, I can work with this. Izuku put his notebook away as the future assassin in front of him stood and bowed. I'll get the plan to you by the end of this week. There you are, mastermind. I've been looking for you. Izuku scowled as Hizashi Midoriya, aka Dragon, aka Deadbeat Dad of the Year, walked into the room like he owned the place. It had only taken a few months in the villain world for Izuku to figure out the truth behind the whole working overseas thing he'd been told his entire life. The worst part was, he wasn't even surprised. Sure, Mom might believe that her loving husband was just working overseas because that's where his company needed him. But Izuku had always thought it was just a little too suspicious that he'd been unavoidably transferred right after Izuku was diagnosed quackless. Izuku glanced at the man his meeting was actually with, who looked just as surprised to see Hizashi as he was. Good. 
That meant he wouldn't have to kill him. Izuku put enough hatred behind his glare to send the most seasoned villains running and turn to his father. Get out of my way, dragon. I have no interest in talking to you. He moved to walk past Hisashi, who stopped him by grabbing his arm. His father really was an idiot, wasn't he? Did he conveniently forget what Izuku did to those who crossed him? Or did he just delude himself into thinking that couldn't possibly happen to him? Now, now, mastermind, I just want to talk. Jiren was being an ass and trying to keep us apart, but he's out of the way now. So there's no need to pretend you're not honoured to work with a major player in the underground, such as myself. I assure you, the decision to not work with you was entirely my own, Izuku growled. Maybe if this guy wanted to work with him, he should have stuck around to raise him. As it was, Hisashi couldn't even recognise his own son's voice. Hisashi frowned. Come on now, mastermind, be reasonable. The Dragon's Horde is an extremely successful gang. We have the money to pay you for your services. There is no sum of money you could pay me to convince me to work with you. Izuku wrenched his arm out of Hisashi's grip. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. He kept a few knives ready just in case Hisashi's men tried to attack him on the way out, but apparently they were smarter than their boss because they let him pass. Someone followed him, but Izuku lost them easily enough on the rooftops. Izuku shook his head as he changed out of his villain outfit and walked home. Why his mom had ever married an asshole like Hisashi, he would never know. Hisashi knocked the papers off his desk in frustration. Who does that? snot-nosed kid think he is. I am Dragon. I am respected. Mastermind hasn't even been on the scene for two years. What gives him the right to snub me like that? Hazashi took a deep breath. He wouldn't stand for this. Mastermind didn't have a monopoly on threats and blackmail. The people he had taken out were weak or new to the game, but Hazashi had been doing this for 20 years, and the Dragon's Horde was a force to be reckoned with. He wasn't about to take orders from some kid barely out of diapers. He just had to find something to hold over his head. Boys, I need you to find everything you can on Mastermind. Hazashi's face broke out into a feral grin. I think it's time that brat learned his place. Hazashi looked at the photo his lackey had handed him, crumpling the edges slightly from how tightly he was gripping it. Are you sure this is Mastermind's civilian identity? His lackey nodded. Yes, sir. The brokers would only sell it to me if I proved I wasn't a cop. They did warn us not to get on his bad side, though. Hisashi hadn't actually seen Izuku since just after his fourth birthday, when he realised his son was always going to be useless. If he thought it would have worked, he would have tried to convince Inko the boy wasn't worth her time and dropped him off at the nearest orphanage. But Inko had always been too attached to go for that idea. So Hazashi had just decided to send child support checks and be done with it. But it seemed that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Of course his son was cunning enough to become Mastermind. Really, he shouldn't have been surprised. But that just made Mastermind's refusal to work with him all the more confusing. Shouldn't Izuku have some respect for his own father? Maybe he didn't know. Well, this made things much easier. All he had to do to get Mastermind on his side was rekindle his relationship with his wife and son. Then, the world would be in his hands. Once Izuku realised that the illustrious dragon was his father, Hisashi was sure he wouldn't hesitate to obey him. That was what sons were supposed to do, right? Obey their fathers? And if Izuku didn't want to obey him out of love, then maybe guilt would do the trick. Make it seem like a nice father-son activity they could do together to get closer, and make up for lost time. His plan was flawless. But there was always the possibility that Izuku would be stubborn. Hisashi had heard that teenagers were like that sometimes. It was an annoying trait that just came with age. Of course, his Izuku would never knowingly disobey his father, but it paid to be prepared. Hisashi thought for a moment. What would he do if, after everything, Izuku refused to obey him? He frowned. It would be inconvenient, because he'd always cared for his wife, and he would be inevitably questioned if anything would happen to her. But there were other women in the world, many even more attractive than Inko, since she'd put on weight during the last decade. 
Hazashi nodded as he cemented his plan. In the highly unlikely event that Azuka refused to do his duty to Hazashi, then threatening Ingo would be more than enough to keep him in line. Clear my schedule for tomorrow, he grinned. I'm taking a family day. Izuku raised an eyebrow at his mother when somebody knocked the door as they watched TV after breakfast. They weren't expecting anyone, were they? The only time they ever really got visitors was when the Bakugos came over for dinner, but they never showed up on Saturdays. I'll get it. Inko smiled at him as she stood to go answer the door. You just stay on the couch, sweetie. I'll be back in a minute. Inko bustled through the front door, and there was a long moment before Izuku heard her gasp. He jumped from the couch and ran to the hall, already coming up with a dozen plans to protect her if it came to that. She was staring at the man on the doorstep, but turned around when she heard him behind her. There were happy tears in her eyes as she gripped the man's hand, and Izuku carefully hid his scowl as he took in exactly who was at the door. Hello, son, Hizashi smiled. Long time no see. Chapter 37 Daddy Issues Come and eat with us, son, Hizashi laughed. Don't be shy. Izuku wanted to scowl at him and tell him to get out of their house, but his mum was watching and she looked so happy that Hazashi was finally home, so Izuku settled for a strained smile. He sat down so he was facing Hazashi, who had taken the place at the head of the table, like he actually deserved to sit there. Hazashi smiled at him as Inko finished putting food on the table and sat down. You've grown up so much, son. Hazashi grinned at him widely. Izuku glared at him as Inko looked down to serve the food. Did he think Izuku was stupid enough not to see through their loving father act? Especially since he waltzed back into their life, right as Dragon is pushing to get something from Mastermind. Did his father think he was an idiot? Apparently he did, because he was smiling sweetly at Inko, like he didn't have a care in the world and Inko was eating it up. Izuku wanted to scream at her not to trust him, that the only reason he was even still sending money was because if he didn't, the government might look into him and discover he was a villain. But then he'd have to explain exactly how he knew that, and just because he knew a confrontation was coming with his father, didn't mean he wanted it to happen in front of his mom. Thanks for the food, Izuku muttered, then took a big bite so he wouldn't have to talk to the asshole sitting across from him. He was having enough of a hard time sitting in brooding silence. He wasn't sure this civility would last if he was forced to talk. So, Hazashi... Inko said. Why didn't you tell us you were coming to visit? I didn't even know you were in town. Izuku resisted the urge to roll his eyes as Hazashi gave a booming laugh. I just wanted to surprise my wife and son. What's the harm in that? I've missed you two so much. I just couldn't get away from work. You know how fast-paced things are in America. I don't know how long I'll be back in Japan. It depends how well things go with the business associate I have here. But I'll be pushing to stay here as long as possible. Izuku huffed quietly. Business associate. Yeah, right. Hizashi would stay around for as long as Izuku did what he wanted, playing the part of a loving father, when really he was anything but. Hopefully Inko wouldn't be too sad when he inevitably disappeared again. But she'd survived over ten years without him. She didn't need him to be happy. Oh, that's wonderful, honey! Inko gushed. I hope you get to stay. It would be wonderful to have you around, and you can get to know Izuku. I know you two are going to get on just great. Hizashi laughed again. Yeah, I sure hope so. Just looking at him now, I'm sure he takes after his father. Except the hair, of course. He got your beautiful hair, Inko. Inko blushed as Hizashi smiled at her. Oh, stop it, Hizashi. You can't just start laying on the compliments out of nowhere. But you're just as beautiful as the day I married you. Why shouldn't a loving husband compliment his gorgeous wife? Inko giggled, and Izuku finished his food. Mom, I'll be in my room if you need me. Inko frowned. But, Izuku, don't you want to spend more time with your dad? He doesn't get time in Japan very often, so we need to take advantage of it. Hizashi put his arm around her. I agree. Maybe we could go to the park like we used to, huh, son? I bet you'd like that, wouldn't you? Izuku raised an eyebrow at him sceptically. All three of us? Hizashi spluttered for a moment before smiling. Well, I was thinking it would be just the two of us, son. Have some father-son bonding time. That's a wonderful idea, Hizashi! Inko clapped her hands together. 
I'll pack you a few snacks for later, and you two can head out, okay? Ozuku frowned, but nodded as his mum bustled to pack a basket for them. I just need to grab something from my room real quick, alright? I'll be back by the time we're ready to leave. Inko nodded, and Ozuku went to his room and closed the door, feeling Hazashi's eyes on him the whole time. He knelt beside his bed and pulled a steel box out from underneath it, entering the passcode to open it. He kept most of his knives at his base, but he was grateful he decided to keep a few here for emergencies, locked away where his mum wouldn't find them. He took off his shirt so he could attach the holsters underneath, then switched to a black long sleeve shirt so he could have more knives accessible around his hands. He took a moment to make sure he could grab all the knives. Arms, check. Waist, check. Ankles, check. He smiled and went back out to the living room, where Hazashi was waiting for him by the door. Ready, son? Izuku nodded, putting on his shoes and walking out the door. So what park did you have in mind? There's a really pretty one down by the river. I think you'll really like it, Hazashi said. It's kind of out of the way, but it's gorgeous, trust me. Izuku had no plans to trust Hazashi on anything anytime soon. He was pretty sure he knew what Park Izashi was talking about. It was isolated, and basically under an overpass by a busy freeway, so it couldn't be seen or even heard by people passing by. Izuku had heard stories of gunshots going off that no one called in, simply because they thought it was someone blowing a tyre instead. Overall, it was the perfect place for back alley deals, but parents and kids avoided it like the plague, so there was no doubt in Izuku's mind how things were going to go once they got there. The train ride was... awkward. Hazashi tried several times to ask him about various hobbies he had, but Izuku just gave one-word answers, until he finally stopped trying. After that, Hazashi tried telling him stories that he probably thought were funny, but that were really just prejudiced, racist, or some other kind of messed up. Seriously, the man was such a narcissist that he didn't even realise what an asshole he was. They got off the train, and Hazashi led the way to the park that Izuku had been thinking of. Izuku rolled his eyes when he saw that it was busier than he'd ever seen it, but with adults, not a kid in sight. There were men pretending to talk to each other by the playground, and a few who were supposedly busy looking out over the water, but of course, no matter what they were doing, they all glanced up when Hazashi and Izuku entered, and then pretended they hadn't. How did the Dragon's Horde even become so successful when their plans were this transparent. Hazashi led him over to a picnic table, and they sat down. Now, Izuku, I know that this may come as a shock to you, but we're really not so different, you and I. Izuku raised one eyebrow and gestured for him to continue. The sooner they got over with this, the sooner he could go home. Hazashi smiled. Well, son, unlike your mother, I know what you've been up to. He paused for dramatic effect. I know your mastermind. Izuku clapped his hands slowly. Congratulations, dragon. But I knew that from the moment you decided to walk in the door this morning. The question now is what you're going to do about it. Hazashi spluttered for a moment. You knew who I was and you still refused to work with me? Izuku rolled his eyes. I refused to work with you because I knew who you were. What? Did you think I was just going to roll over and work with you, just because you happened to knock up my mum one time? Hazashi's face twisted in rage. I am your father, Izuku. I am the one who gave you life. You wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for me. So maybe, for once in your life, you should try showing a little respect. It is your duty as a son to obey me. My duty? Izuku laughed. I don't have a duty to anyone except for me. That's why I became a villain, because it offers me freedom to do what I want, when I want, just because I can. No one is going to tell Mastermind he can't do something just because he's quirkless, like people have been doing my whole life. But I guess you didn't even think about why I became Mastermind, did you? You just thought I was one more thing you could exploit. What? Hazashi stood. I love you. You owe me. Izuku glared up at him. I don't owe you shit. Hisashi's scowl deepened. I didn't want to have to do this, son, but you forced my hand. If you insist on continuing this childish tantrum, I'll have no choice but to punish your mother for your insolence. 
Izuku scoffed. And you pretend you love her? He shook his head. Do you know who the last guy that threatened Mum was? Hizashi. Hizashi rolled his eyes. Whoever he was, he was weak. But I assure you, I am different. Izuku chuckled humorlessly. I don't think weak was a word most people usually associated with overhaul. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw some of his father's men shifting uncomfortably, probably remembering that not only had Overhaul been destroyed, but his entire gang had been killed. Hazashi, however, just shook his head. Overhaul was a child, barely in charge of a struggling Yakuza because the old leader died. Izuku sighed. Yes, and All Might was the symbol of peace for decades. Are you saying he was weak too? Hazashi's face hardened. You will work with me, son, or you will regret it. Izuku shrugged and stood. I think you'll be the one with regrets. I'm not the helpless little quirkless kid you abandoned anymore, Hazashi. I have the reputation I do because I've earned it. Hazashi sighed heavily. Oh well, son, I hoped it wouldn't come to this. But I suppose I should tell you that we're not alone here. Dragon's Horde. Be careful just to rough him up a little. We don't want him dead. Yet. Izuku flipped the table up to shield himself from the quirked attacks that were thrown at him, and got out two of his knives as he waited for the close-range combatters to approach. Hizashi had brought along a dozen men in total, most of which were heavy hitters. But they also weren't the smartest, since intelligent criminals didn't follow idiots like Hizashi. A man with a snake quirk ran up and tried to bite him, but Izuku simply dodged his fangs and slit his throat. The next two men who tried to attack him met a similar fate just as quickly. Izuku smiled as Hizashi's men looked at each other hesitantly, clearly realising they had underestimated him. Three of the men still standing looked at their dead friends, gulped, then turned to run away. "'Come back here, you cowards!' Hizashi yelled. "'You'll regret this!' I really don't think you'll be alive long enough to follow through with that threat, Hazashi. Izuku laughed. I also think you just lost your three smartest men. Hazashi growled and signalled the rest of his men forward, but Izuku was already running towards them, knives at the ready. One of the men managed to knock him off his feet with a rope quirk, but Izuku simply waited until he was dragged closer to the man before slicing through the rope holding his ankle and killing the man now that he was in range. He threw one of his knives into another's throat, replacing it with one of the other knives hidden beneath his clothes. Hizashi watched as Izuku slaughtered the men with disdain. Weak, all of you. He's a child. How is he giving you this much trouble? Izuku simply killed another lackey, who made the mistake of getting too close. Another had followed the lead of the three that had run away earlier, clearly deciding that he wasn't getting out of this alive if he kept attacking. Izuku stared down his last two opponents, and grinned as they screamed to rush at him at once. He ducked between them and sent one of them sprawling with a well-aimed kick, using him to knock the other down, and killed them both before they could get up. Hizashi frowned as he looked at his dead men, then sighed. I suppose if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. He took a deep breath, and Izuku ducked behind a tree as the scolding flames left his mouth. Hizashi took another deep breath, but Izuku threw one of his knives so it lodged right underneath his vocal cords. Hizashi tried to exhale, but half of the flames came sputtering out around the knife, burning the unprotected skin at his neck. Hizashi pulled the knife out in frustration and threw it to the ground, but that only made him bleed faster. He tried to take another breath to fuel his quirk, but he got a lungful of blood instead. Izuku smiled as he walked up to his father, who tried to grab at him. But Izuku simply cut the man's hand so he couldn't. He then cut the tendons behind his knees so he couldn't kick either before knocking him to the ground. Izashi coughed as he turned to stare up at Izuku with burning hatred. Izuku rolled his eyes. I told you, Hizashi, I will never work with you. He left his father bleeding out as he gathered his knives and went down to the river to wash the blood off his skin and hair. The black shirt he was wearing hid the stains well. But Izuku grimaced when he saw the red patches spreading across his jeans. He couldn't go home like that. He sighed and grabbed some of the mud from the riverbank, spreading it into the fabric of his jeans and putting some into his hair too, just to be thorough. When he was sure the mud had covered all the blood, he stood and went to leave. 
but a weak movement caught his eyes. He frowned when he saw Hazashi weakly struggling. Izuku had thrown his knife to compromise his airway, and he must have missed the major veins and arteries in Hazashi's neck, since it was taking him so long to die. Or maybe he was just stubborn. Either way, Izuku knelt beside him and looked into his eyes for a long moment before taking out one of his knives and slicing through Hazashi's jugular vein. It would still take him a minute or two to completely bleed out, but there was no way he'd still be alive by the time someone else visited the park. Izuku kicked his father one last time, revelling in the way he tried to gasp but couldn't, before walking away from the bloodbath with a smile. He got a few weird looks on the train as other commuters crinkled their nose with disgust at the mud at his pants, but he didn't pay them any mind. The sun was just starting to set by the time he walked in the front door. Izuku took his shoes off, careful not to spread more mud in the entry than he had to, and looked at his pants. What little blood he could see had dried brown during his commute, so his mum wouldn't notice even if she happened to get too close. From the kitchen, he could smell his mum cooking dinner for three. Izuku? Hazashi? Are you home? Inko walked into the entryway and gasped. Izuku, what happened to you? Izuku smiled. I just tripped and fell in some mud in the park, Mum. It's no big deal, but I'd like to shower before dinner, if that's all right. His mum nodded and sighed in relief. Yes, that's fine. I'm so glad you're all right, Izuku. She looked around and frowned. Where's your father? Izuku schooled his expression and shrugged. He ran into some old friends at the park, and I got bored, so I just came home. I don't know how long he'll be. Inko nodded. Okay. I'm glad he was able to talk to his friends. Maybe they'll be able to convince him to stay in Japan a little longer. You go shower, sweetie. Dinner will be ready in an hour. You can just leave your clothes, and I'll wash them tomorrow. Izuku smiled. Don't worry, Mum. I'll take care of it. You just focus on dinner. You're so sweet, Izuku, Inko smiled. I'm so lucky to have such a wonderful son. Chapter 38 Raised to be a Hero Keigo wasn't doing too hot. On the one hand, the League seemed to be trusting him more, going so far as to invite him to hang out with them at least once a week, even when they weren't planning on doing anything nefarious. This, by all accounts, was a very good thing. The Hero Commission was happy with his work, and Kiko was happy because the more time he spent around the League, the more he was gathering info. But on the other hand, the more he hung around them, the less they seemed like villains he was supposed to be spying on, and the more they seemed like friends he was supposed to protect. That was weird, right? Maybe he was getting too close to the case and should ask the Commission to pull him out? Kiko felt a weird tug of... sadness? Reluctance? Was that what this was? Kigo sighed as he flew towards the Hero Commission headquarters to give his report. He couldn't help it that spending time with the League was fun. Getting crushed at video games by Shigaraki, debating conspiracies with Shoto and Spinner, laughing with Darby as Twice argued with himself and Toga cheered him on. Kigo had never felt anything like it. It felt... right, somehow. Like this is how things were supposed to be. As weird as it was... He didn't think he'd ever been happier than he was in those stolen moments he spent with the League. He shook his head. No, these were villains. They killed people. Kigo had watched them kill people, and watched on national television as they slaughtered the last number one hero. These weren't his friends. They were... what? They were villains. That's all they were, and all they needed to be. Besides, he didn't need friends anyway. Hadn't the Hero Commission always told him growing up that friends would just get in the way? He was a hero, so he was supposed to be above all that. He was a friend of the people, after all. That was the most important thing. But would the Commission even let him pull out at this point? They never had before. They'd probably just tell him it was a good thing the League saw him as a friend, and tell him to stop complaining about nothing. He had a duty to the people. He had a duty to the Commission. Kigo nodded with determination. There was no point in asking to be pulled out. He could still spend time with the League, and he wouldn't be wasting the Commission's time. It was a win-win. He landed on the roof and made his way through the halls to Mira's office. The man was sleeping at his desk when Kigo walked in and snuck up to the desk. His handler had fallen asleep with a few open files, 
and Kigo couldn't help but being a curious little bird as he glanced over them before waking Mira up. Why was Mira looking over files for little kids? Were they missing? No wonder Mira was always so tired if he was trying to do the police department's job in addition to his own. Kiko leaned closer as Mira shifted in his sleep, giving a better view of the files. Each of the four children had their names and ages, none of them were older than ten, written beneath their photos, along with their height and their parents' names, if they had any, which two of them didn't. Kigo peeked at the other data and froze. Candidate for the Legacy Feeder Programme. He couldn't breathe. The Legacy Feeder Program is what the Commission had called it when they took him away to raise him into a hero. Were those kids going to be like him? Were they going to grow up knowing nothing but training to be a hero until they were old enough to get a license, never going to school with kids their own age, never being allowed to do anything if it didn't help mould them into what the Commission wanted them to be? For the first time, Kigo processed the bright red ink stamped across each of the pages. Approved. How many others like him were there? Did they see how well Kigo worked out and decided to keep the program going? Or had he even been the first? Why had the Commission never told him? If they were hiding this from him, what else were they hiding? Kigo took a deep breath and shook his head. It didn't matter. The Commission knew what they were doing. They weren't trying to hide this because it was morally wrong. It's just that confidentiality was part of the hero world. Part of what made the hero system possible. Isn't that what they told him when he asked why he wasn't allowed to talk to people about his childhood? It was to keep him safe. He forced a smile onto his face and slammed his hands on the desk. Morning, Mira. Mira jumped about a foot in the air and yelped, then glared at Kigo. Just, why? Kigo gave him a shit-eating grin. Why not? What you working on? Kigo didn't miss the way that Mira discreetly moved to close the files. Nothing important. How's your work going with the League? Have you found anything useful? Kigo shrugged. I think they're planning on going after the Dorada Casino next. Spinner was complaining that they have some super quirkist policies and don't allow some heteromorphic quirks or the quirkless in their high-end rooms. Mira was silent for a long moment, and Kigo was just starting to think he'd fallen asleep again when he spoke. For the amount of time you're spending with the League, you don't seem to be getting a whole lot of information. Kiko froze. Well, I mean, most of the time the League spends together is just hanging out, not planning stuff. I mean, just people like the rest of us. They need downtime. Mira's eyes hardened into a glare. They are villains, Hawks. Not people. And don't you forget it. They gave up their rights when they decided to disobey. Kigo opened his mouth and closed it a few times before nodding. Yes, sir. I don't mean to be harsh, Hawks, Mira continued softly. But you know how important it is that we take down the League, and you are essential to that plan. People everywhere are relying on you to keep them safe from those monsters. If you're not trying hard enough to get information, then... Well, what happens to them is on you. Don't forget, Kigo. But this is your purpose. This is what we raised you for. It's your responsibility to take down the League. So don't disappoint everyone who's counting on you. A familiar feeling of guilt settled in Kigo's stomach. Okay, I'll try harder. Mira smiled. Good boy. Now go out and be the number one hero we need. Kago nodded numbly and went back up to the roof so he could feel the familiar feeling of wind rushing through his hair and feathers. He disappointed everyone again. He was... He didn't even deserve the number one spot, did he? The commission had raised him to. Kago gasped softly as everything fell into place. No matter how much he tried to deny it, the commission had raised him to be the number one hero, just like Endeavour had tried to raise Darby and Shoto. He hadn't disappointed the people at all, had he? He disappointed the Commission, and they were just using the idea of protecting innocence to guilt him into doing what they wanted. Had he ever felt this guilt when he wasn't with them? Had he ever felt this when he was with the League? What about those kids? 
those kids were going to go through the same psychological torture and manipulation he'd gone through his entire life, until all that was left was the perfect tools for the Commission to use. Did the Commission even see him as a human being? Or just as an object they could use and exploit for their own gain? At least the League saw him as a person, and liked spending time with him even when he wasn't doing anything for them. And how sad was that? That the villains he was supposed to be destroying treated him better than the people who raised him. Kago took one deep breath, then flung himself off the roof, revelling in the freedom of flying. Chapter 39 Asking the Right Questions Izuku, can you come to the front room? There's someone here who wants to talk to us. Izuku locked his laptop and put it away before leaving his bedroom. What is it, Mum? Who? Detective Tsukashi stood in the entryway, and Izuku froze. What was the detective tasked with finding him doing in his house? Did he suspect Izuku? Was he here to arrest him? Izuku glanced behind Tsukashi. If he was, then why didn't he bring backup? Were they waiting outside? Izuku's mind kept running through possibilities and escape plans as Izuku took Tsukashi's coat and led him to the couch. Would you like some tea, detective? Inko asked. Tsukashi shook his head. Not today, Mrs. Midoriya. I don't want to put this off. So, if you don't mind me asking, Izuku eyed Tsukashi carefully, what's a detective doing in our house? Tsukashi frowned softly. There's no easy way to say this, but I have some bad news. He looked at Inko. Your husband, Hizashi Midoriya, was murdered some time yesterday afternoon. I'm so sorry for your loss. Inko gasped and tears started streaming down her face. But, but I thought, he can't be. He was only in Japan for a few days for business. We were going to be a family again. Who would? Tsukashi looked confused. Why did you say he was only in Japan for a few days? Hisashi, he... He worked in America. We haven't seen him for years because his company wouldn't give him any time off. He came in for a few days to, to surprise us. Izuku rubbed his mother's back as she started sobbing. Oh, um, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Tsukashi said. But Hisashi Midoriya was the villain known as Dragon and the leader of a gang known as the Dragon's Horde. There is no record of him even leaving the country in the past decade, much less working abroad. I have to tell you this because we believe that it may have been one of his enemies in the underworld who killed him. Was he acting suspiciously yesterday at all? Izuku scoffed. Just him showing up was suspicious, considering he hadn't visited in ten years. Izuku! Inko scolded. He was your father! Have some respect! Well... I still need to ask you both a few questions, if possible, to help us find his killer. What time did you last see Hisashi yesterday? He and Izuku left to go on a walk right after lunch, Inko said softly. They were supposed to be home in time for dinner, and Izuku was on time, but Hisashi... She cut herself off with a sob, and Sakashi turned to Izuku. So you went on a walk after lunch? Izuku nodded as he reviewed what he knew about Tsukashi's quirk, lie detector. It allowed him to know if what people were saying was truth or a lie, but as long as what Izuku said was technically true, the quirk shouldn't register falsehoods. He could work with that. Yes, Hisashi said he wanted to have some father-son bonding time, and offered to take me to a park. It was a bit out of the way, but I wasn't the one that chose it. True. Tsukashi nodded. It was so strange to him that Dragon's family didn't even know of his double life. Had Dragon left the family to protect them? If so, why had he come back? All right. Uh, about what time did you arrive at the park? Izuku shrugged. It was early afternoon, I think. I don't know the exact time. True. Which park did you go to? I don't know the name of it, but it's hidden under an overpass, and there's a river that runs by it. We had to take the train to get there. True. Tsukashi sighed. That was where Dragon's body had been found, 
which meant that Azuku was probably one of the last people to see him alive. He might even have seen his father's murderer. Tsukashi hoped for the kid's safety that he hadn't. The intel they had on Dragon said that he'd been trying to push Mastermind for a deal, but Mastermind wasn't having it. So there was a good chance Dragon had been killed by the number one villain in Japan. Izuku was an innocent kid who had just lost his father. He didn't need the danger that came along with being a witness in the Mastermind investigation. Do you know why your father took you to that park? Tsukashi asked. There are others closer to here. I think it was because of how secluded it was. He had some things he wanted to talk to me about. True. Do you mind telling me what those things were? He wanted me to join him. True. Izuku! Inko sobbed and wrapped her arms around her son. Baby, why didn't you tell me? Tsukashi frowned. Did you know that Hizashi was dragon? Izuku was silent for longer than Tsukashi thought was strictly necessary. He mentioned it when we got to the park. True. And how did you respond? Izuku scoffed. I told him there was no way I'd work with him. I have no interest in joining a gang. True. Well, that at least was a relief. And it seemed that Dragon hadn't really pressed the issue, since Izuku was here, alive and well. Your mother mentioned that you came home on time, but Hizashi didn't. Did you leave the park together? No. Hizashi ran into some friends while we were there, and since our conversation was over, I decided to leave him with them. True. Poor kid. Dad wants him to be a villain, then runs into friends, probably also villains, so he gets bored and decides to go home. Seemed like a standard teenage reaction to a long-winded parent. Well, except for the whole recruitment situation. But these friends... Some of them were probably the other members of the Dragon's Horde that they found dead alongside Dragon. But there was also a possibility that one of them had been Mastermind. These friends of his, would you mind describing them to me? Izuka shrugged. They were all just your standard street thugs. True. None of them were teenagers? Izuka looked at him strangely. No, they were all adults. Why? True. Tsukashi breathed a sigh of relief. We believe that Mastermind, who we have evidence may be a teenager, was involved in your father's death. If you had seen him, you would most likely be in a lot of danger right now. Oh, my poor baby! Inko hugged Izuku tighter than ever. Tsukashi frowned. He'd asked all the questions he'd prepared, and it seemed like Izuku had already left the park by the time the fight went down. But something just seemed off. Maybe it was because most people told at least one white lie while talking to him. Or maybe it was something about Izuku's behaviour and how calm he seemed, but well, it wouldn't hurt to ask just one more question, right? Just to make sure. All right, just one last question and I'll leave you alone. He looked Izuku in the eye. Was your father still alive when you left the park? Izuku thought back to how he'd left his father, bleeding out with no hope of rescue, and had to hold back a smile. Yes. True. Keigo threw his controller down on the couch after losing to Shigaraki yet again. The entire league was together, and Shigaraki had called them all cowards for refusing to play video games with him. Darby, the traitor, had shoved a controller in Keigo's hands and abandoned him to the unbeatable boss that was Shigaraki, king of video games. Half an hour later... Keigo had died five times, and he was pretty sure that Shigaraki was still on his first life. Don't feel too bad, Hawk, sweetie. Toka leaned over the back of the couch and handed him a slice of pizza. Nobody can beat Shiggy here. He's basically the god of video games. Toga, don't give my brother any more ideas for conspiracy theories, Darby yelled. Shoto looked up from where he was writing something on the table. No, please, keep them coming. Keigo laughed as Twice decided to take up both sides of the argument, trying to convince everyone with nonsensical leaps in logic, and pretty soon, everyone had made their way to the couch to watch the show. This. This must be what family was supposed to feel like. He. He wanted this. Twice's argument ended as he realised that whatever side won, he was still the winner, so there was no point. 
The group fell into companionable silence, and Kigo bit his lip. Maybe now would be a good time? Um, guys? Everyone turned to look at him as soon as he broke the silence, and Kigo tried to swallow his nerves. You know how. Well, you know how you've accused me of being an infiltrator a few times? Shoto nodded. What about it? Kago hesitated a moment. What if that were true? There was a long moment of silence as the League processed what he said. Finally, Darby spoke up. It'd suck, and we might have to kill you. But you're a pretty cool guy, Birdie, so we'd be sad about it if that's any consolation. Kago chuckled, but it fell flat. He stared at the floor as he debated his next words. And what if I didn't want it to be true anymore? What? Kigo looked up at his friend's confused faces. I... I've been thinking about it a lot, and... Maybe I don't want to be a hero anymore. The Commission assigned me to infiltrate the League before Endeavour's death, so that's how this all started out. But... It's different now. I wasn't ever allowed to have friends growing up, since the Commission was focused on making me into their perfect little puppet. I don't think I could ever ask for better friends than you guys. Aww! Togo rushed forward to hug him. That's the sweetest thing anyone's ever said about us. Let him breathe, crazy. Darby pulled her away. But in all serious, Birdie. Thanks. But you can't just decide to be a villain because you've got friends who've made some questionable life decisions. If your heart's not in it, you'll just regret it later. My heart is in it. I don't want out. Kego took a moment to gather his thoughts. Ever since I was taken by the Commission as a kid, I've been their captive, letting them manipulate and brainwash me into doing whatever they want. I can't live like that anymore. I... I just want to be free. Shoto came over and put his hand on Kego's shoulder. Don't worry, Hawks. We'll get you out of there. Yeah, Spinner said. You're one of us, Hawks. You deserve to be free. I knew the commission had to be corrupt to keep churning out all those false heroes. Kigo laughed as his eyes filled with tears. He'd been hiding his true emotions for so long, first from the commission, then from the League. It was so refreshing to just be... him. You guys are amazing, you know that. Mmm, Shigaraki frowned. The best thing for us would probably be for you to keep up appearances with the Commission, but give us the information instead of them. But, based on what you just said, I'm guessing that's not what you want to do? Kigo shook his head. I can't. I don't want to be their puppet anymore. Not now that I know that they're manipulating me. I either want to be all in or all out. And I'm here with you because I've chosen to go all out. Darby turned to Shigaraki. Come on, Dusty. They've been keeping this birdie in a cage for too long. We gotta set him free. Yeah, Spinner added. And turning him openly will be the perfect chance to expose the Commission's true corruption. I... I'm not the only one, Kigo said, turning to Shigaraki. There are other kids like me that the Commission is raising to be weapons. If I can help them, I have to. But I can't do that if I stay here. Shigaraki stared at them all for a moment before sighing. Whatever. I won't ask you to stay there if you don't want to. But you do know what you're signing up for, right? You'll have to stay here in hiding like us, Spinner said. It's better to hide with friends than live openly with enemies, Kigo responded. Your friends and family will feel betrayed, Shoto added. I never had a family. You guys are the only friends I've ever known. Your fans will hate you. Mr. Compress said. If they do, I would have at least shown them the true enemy. Well then, Shigaraki smiled. Welcome to the League of Villains. Chapter 40 The Free Fall of a Hero You're a lot... different than I thought you'd be, Kigo said slowly. Izuku laughed. What? Were you expecting some old guy with too many tattoos? No, Kago denied. I knew you were young, but... You just look so innocent. Yeah, well, how do you think he's avoided detection for so long? Shoto asked. Nobody ever even looks twice at the quirkless kid, especially not one that looks as plain as Azuku. 
Hugo shook his head. I guess that makes sense. It's just, wow, I never would have suspected you were the number one villain. Izuku shrugged. I didn't ask for that title, but I think I've earned it. You'll probably be the last number one hero, you know. Yeah, Kigo said. I think the position's probably been cursed for a long time, but it's just been more obvious recently. Izuku smiled at him. Well then, let's destroy that cursed throne and make sure it doesn't hurt anybody else. Izuku pulled up his mask and hood. Are you ready to show everyone what it really means to be free? Mira yawned as he oversaw the new recruits to the Legacy Feeder Program. Some of them were a bit more rebellious than Hawks had been when he was younger, but that wouldn't last long. One already seemed eager to please, so he would probably be used as the example for the others. By the time they were old enough to get their hero licenses, they would be just as loyal to the commission as Hawks was. The kids looked up from their training as a shrill alarm cut through the air and woke Mira up the rest of the way. They looked at him with fear and confusion. Is there a fire somewhere? Should we evacuate? Don't worry about it, Mira said. This part of the facility is so far underground that we shouldn't be in any danger. Most likely, it's just some prankster sidekick pulling the alarm. So keep training, I'll go investigate. The kids nodded, and Mira turned around to go upstairs, only to find his way blocked by a scowling hawks. Mira unconsciously took a few steps back as he was forcefully reminded that Hawks was a raptor, like an eagle or a falcon, that could easily rip him limb from limb. He took a deep breath. No. Hawks was unwaveringly loyal to the Commission, just like they raised him to be. So Mira wasn't in any danger. Hawks, what a nice surprise. What are you doing down here? I'm here to free those kids, Hawks growled. I won't let them go through what I went through. Mira froze. They are training to be powerful heroes, Hawks. I thought you were grateful for the training we gave you. After all, you wouldn't have become the hero you are today without our help. We're not training them to be heroes. The kids had stopped their training to listen. This was bad. You're training them to be weapons. Don't try and pretend that this training is for their benefit, when you and I both know that you're conditioning them to be unthinkingly loyal to the Commission, so they'll do whatever you want even things that no real hero would be willing to do. Hawks, Mira said softly. Perhaps it'd be best if we talk privately. Let's go to my office, we can. It's too late to talk, Mira. And besides, why would I ever believe a word you say, when everything you've ever said to me was to manipulate me into becoming the perfect little tool for the commission to use? You kept me isolated from the world, and never let me have friends, so I'd never realise how fucked up my childhood was. But guess what? Hawks grinned. Joke's on you. Because I've got friends now. They've opened my eyes. And I met them on a mission you assigned me. Mira was filled with a cold dread as he connected the dots. But no, Hawks, you are a hero. Hawks was far too fast for Mira to dodge as he used one of his feathers as a sword and buried it in Mira's gut. Not anymore. Himiko stabbed and sucked as she, Spinner and Compress steadily chopped their way through an army of agents defending the commission. Twice was currently with Gentle, who Mind chan had invited because he wanted help from Labrava, and also because Gentle wouldn't want to miss a high-profile crime such as this. There were currently drones following each member of the League of Villains who were live-streaming to Gentle's YouTube account to make sure the public didn't miss any of the juicy details they were exposing today. Labrava was currently in the server room, hacking into their mainframe and exposing all the commission's secrets to the world, as Shigaraki and Mindchan stood guard. Spinner had pointed out that it was likely some of the commission's dirty laundry was kept offline as a defence against hacking, which seemed complicated to Himiko, but she supposed it did make a certain kind of sense. That was why Twice was raiding the file room. The plan was to use Gentle's rubberizing quirk on the boxes, and throw them out of the windows to the reporters who were obviously going to congregate on the street below during the attack. Who knows what juicy secrets they would find. All at once, each of the opponents they were facing fell to the ground as feathers slashed through their hearts. Himiko looked up to see Hawks walking towards her, with four little kids cowering behind him. Ah, Hawks! Compress exclaimed. I see you're developing a taste for the dramatic. What can I say, old man? 
Hawks laughed. I learnt from the best. Flattery will get you everywhere. Compress waggled his finger at Hawks as he pretended to scold him. You could have left some for us, Toga pouted. Be patient, Toga, Spinner said. False heroes will no doubt be showing up soon, lining up for us to cull them. Spinner went over to the kids and knelt in front of them as they shrunk back. You kids have nothing to fear from us. These corrupt men were going to turn you into the false heroes like the ones Stain condemned. So you're lucky we're able to save you from that fate before it was too late. Go on outside. Find the police. A battle is no place for children. The kids hesitated a long moment, before Hawks rolled his eyes and just used some of his feathers to sweep them out of the door by their shirt collars. What? They're already traumatised. They don't need to be here any longer. Darby and Shoto came running through a side door, out of breath. Can we finish torching this place yet? Darby snapped. We were setting small fires outside, just enough to raise the alarm, like Masterman said, but then the police started shooting at us. Not yet, Hawk said. If we destroy the building before the other teams finish exposing the corruption, the Commission will just find a new building. We need to make sure there's no way they can come back from this. Darby chuckled. I'm pretty sure the number one hero turning villain would be enough on its own, but this is your revenge mission, so whatever. Whee! Twice yelled as he landed on a bouncy patch of air at the bottom of the stairs. What was that, Gentle? Why'd you push me? I didn't push you, my dear, twice, Gentle said as he landed on the same patch. Need I remind you that you jumped while yelling, Catch me, let me die? Himiko snorted. Oh, Jin, did you have fun clearing out all those files? So much fun! What a chore! All right, we're just waiting for Labrava's team now, right? Shoto asked. Not anymore, Mainchan said, as he, Shigaraki, and Labrava came up from one of the basements. Both he and Shigaraki were covered in a mix of blood and dust, so they must have run into some resistance. Did everything go okay? Everyone nodded, and Mainchan cracked his neck. What do you guys think? Do you want to stick around and fight some heroes, or just go home and celebrate? I believe it's time we take our final bows, Compress said. There was a round of agreement and Hawk smiled. Thank you guys for this. I know you weren't planning on attacking the commission. So it means a lot that you were willing to do this for me. Whatever, Birdie, Darby said. What are friends for? All right. Gentle, would you mind making a shield in front of us? Shigaraki, call the doctor and tell him to get Johnny ready. The group strode out the doors with Hawks at the front bullets bouncing ineffectually off the rubberized air in front of them. Toga noticed Detective Tsukashi in the crowd, and stuck her tongue out at him, right before she started choking on the nasty grey gunk, and found herself back at home. Chapter 41 The Notebook Izuku, you're going to be late for school! Izuku cursed and finished up his notes. He normally wouldn't bring work home with him, but things had been crazy since the commission fell. Villain activity had been at an all-time high, as society struggled to readjust and find where heroes were going to fit. So the demand for Ozuku's services had been overwhelming. Ozuku was about to shove the notebook in his backpack, but stopped at the last minute. His bullies often tried to steal his backpack and look through his nerd notebooks, and things were already suspicious enough since Ito had laid off bullying him a few weeks ago. If one of his bullies were to accidentally read his mastermind notes... That would be bad. Izuku, hurry! He cursed and settled for just leaving it on the desk. Mom didn't come into his room often, and when she did, she respected his privacy enough not to open his notebooks. It would be fine. Izuku! Mom opened the door and Izuku shouldered his backpack. You're going to miss the train! All right, all right, I'm going. He kissed Mom on the cheek and closed the door to his room again. Love you! His mom smiled. Love you too, Izuku. Have a great day at school. Inko didn't normally clean Izuku's room. He was a tidy enough boy, and Inko firmly believed in giving children space and trust. But when she peeked her head in that morning, his room had been a mess. Izuku had seemed so stressed lately. Inko didn't know if something had happened at school, or if he was just worried over everything that happened with the commission. But either way, she figured it was her duty as a mother to do something nice for her baby. After she grabbed the mountain of dirty clothes from his floor, she could finally start vacuuming. She was just vacuuming by his desk when she accidentally got too close and bumped it with her hip, knocking off a notebook that had been balanced precariously on the edge. It landed open on the floor, and Inko bent to pick it up and put it back. Before she closed it, 
she happened to glance at the page it had opened to. The best way to combat Mr Brave's quirk is through a fire quirk, too risky to simply cut the hair, since it can still control it when it's detached, either burn alive or... Inko never read Izuku's diaries. She knew they were all rambling about heroes anyway, so there was no need for her to invade his privacy that way. But this was different. This was... violent. Inko couldn't help herself as she numbly read through the book, the vacuum running forgotten beside her. What? What had her baby gotten himself into? Why was he writing things like this? These weren't just lists of some hero's weaknesses. They were plans to kill them, sometimes by using specific quirks. Were these people threatening her baby? They must be. Azuka would never do something like this. Or maybe they had convinced him that they were his friends, and this was peer pressure like the other parents had warned her about. Maybe she should confront him about it. He wouldn't try to hide something like this from his mother, right? But if he really was being threatened... Inko made up her mind, put the vacuum away and walked out the door with a notebook in her purse. This was bigger than her, and it was bigger than Izuku. If her baby really had fallen in with the wrong crowd, she needed help. Tsukashi stared at the ceiling above his desk, unseeing. If someone had asked him two years ago what the biggest change would be in Japan in the next few years, he probably would have said that it would be Toshinori retiring and allowing his successor to take up the number one spot. He never would have predicted Mastermind's reign of terror and the fall of the Hero Commission. Japan would never be the same again. Crime was at an all-time high, as was vigilantism, which police now didn't have any way to fight. What was vigilantism anyway? Doing hero work without a licence? Since the commission had been responsible for issuing licences, that was now everyone. Was it using your clerk in public? Well, lawmakers have been quick to repeal the law prohibiting that, since it was one of the main laws that allowed the commission to rise to power in the first place, and no one wanted a repeat of that disaster. There had already been several new hero licensing systems proposed, and analysts were predicting one would be in place by the end of the year. But in the meantime, it was chaos. However the licensing system ended up, though, it was clear that daylight heroes were a thing of the past. It had become far too obvious with Mastermind's hostage situation that being popular could get you killed. So most heroes had switched to going out mostly at night, and support companies had been busy changing costumes to being more practical and less flashy. Hero schools were still running, but they were training their students to go underground, and had stopped emphasising popularity. Many students had dropped out, and enrolment was at an all-time low. Even UA was only going to offer one hero course next year. But there was something else bothering him besides the general state of society. Tsukashi couldn't stop thinking about the interview he had with Izuku Midoriya. By all accounts, the interview had been routine, just inform the family of the father's death and clear them of suspicion. It should have been an open shut case and have done with it. But the more Tsukashi thought about it, the more it seemed like a puzzle was falling into place. Midoriya was quirkless, which Nezu said was a very real possibility for Mastermind, as hard as that was to believe. That wasn't enough to damn the boy, but it also wasn't the only piece of evidence that pointed it to him. He was the right age to be Mastermind, and there were even the initials. Sure, they had no way of knowing if Mastermind's initials were I.M. or M.I., but it fit. But then, why hadn't it registered as a lie when Midoriya said his father was alive when he left? Had he found some way to trick Tsukashi's quirk? Or had someone else killed Dragon? It just didn't make any sense. It felt like there was something out of reach nagging at him. Just one piece of evidence that was missing that would make everything come together. Tsukashi? Sansa pulled him out of his thoughts. There's a woman here I think you might want to talk to. I put her in interrogation room three for you. Tsukashi nodded and stood, stretching out his back. Oh well, he'd have to come back to his Midoriya is Mastermind theory later. There wasn't quite enough evidence to act on it yet. He grabbed a cup of coffee and almost stopped short when he opened the door to the interrogation room and saw Inko Midoriya waiting for him. She had obviously been crying, and Sansa had apparently offered her a box of tissues because there was already a small mountain of them scattered across the table. In front of her was a plain notebook that didn't seem too suspicious on its own. 
but Sukashi's wild theory made it seem like the most conspicuous object in the entire room. Mrs. Midoriya, it's a pleasure to see you again. What can I help you with? Inko sniffed loudly. It's my son, Izuku. I think he may have fallen in with the wrong crowd. Oh, detective, I don't know what to do. True. Tsukashi sat down across from her. Why do you think that? Has he been acting strangely? Inko shook her head. No, he's still the same sweet boy he always is, but... She pushed the notebook towards him. I found this in his room this morning. True. Tsukashi opened the notebook and gasped. After hours of poring over neatly written murder plans, he could recognise Mastermind's handwriting anywhere. This could be the last piece of evidence he was looking for. Unless Inko was right, and Izuku had simply accidentally made friends with Mastermind somehow. Mastermind could have just asked him to hold on to the notebook for some reason. Mrs. Midoriya, I'm going to ask you something, and I need you to be completely honest with me, Tsukashi said. Is this your son's handwriting? Yes. True. Are you sure? Tsukashi couldn't risk being wrong about this. Yes, it's definitely Izuka's handwriting, were you? True. Tsukashi stood. I need to check a few things, Mrs Midoriya, before I can tell you anything more, so sit tight. Just so you know, you did the right thing by bringing this to us. We're going to help you. Is there anything we can get for you? I can have Sansa bring you a coffee if you like. Inko shook her head. Just protect my baby. Tsukashi turned away so that she couldn't see his face and left, already dialing Nezu. And you're sure? Nezu asked as soon as he arrived. Tsukashi nodded. It all fits. Izuku Midoriya matches everything we know about Mastermind. There was even an incident where Mrs. Midoriya was mugged a few months ago, and from what the officer said, it appears her body could have been completely taken apart and reassembled by someone who looked like a bird, which could mean she was threatened by overhaul. He's the same age, build, height as Mastermind, not to mention his hair colour, which matches some of the earliest reports we ever gathered. His quirklessness practically guarantees he was bullied, like Eri told us, so this notebook is the nail in the coffin. Mrs. Midoriya said it's definitely her son's handwriting. Well then, Nezu smiled, this is a very good thing. I don't know, Tsukashi frowned. I have a distraught mother in the other room who is pleading with me to protect her son, and instead I have to tell her that her son is one of the most infamous villains in modern history. Nezu thought for a moment. Perhaps it would actually be best to hold off on that realisation. What do you mean? She has a right to know. Oh, undoubtedly, Nezu agreed. But the fact is, knowing Mastermind's identity does not resolve his hostage situation in and of itself. We may have won the battle, Detective, but we have yet to win the war. Tsukashi sighed. I guess I just got so caught up in the euphoria of finally knowing that I... It's all right, Detective, Nezu said pleasantly. It happens to the best of us. But the real question is, where do we go from here? And where is that? He probably doesn't keep the murder plans on him, since he said they'd be released automatically if he was ever arrested or killed. Hmm, yes, I agree. The word automatically makes me inclined to believe that they are most likely housed in some sort of computer programme, especially with how closely he's been working with Labrava recently. It's very possible their partnership goes back much farther than we originally thought. Sukashi let out a deep breath. All right, so if that's the case, he'll most likely have some sort of computer that he uses for work that we can get our hands on. Nezu nodded. We'll have to be cautious, though. If Midoriya gets wind of what we're planning, he'll disappear and find a way to punish us for getting too close. He sighed. This is a very precarious situation. Inko looked up as Tsukashi and Nezu opened the door to the interrogation room. What's happening? Is Azuka going to be all right? Do you know who's trying to lead my baby down the wrong path? Tsukashi glanced at Nezu. All we can say at this time, Mrs Midoriya, is that your son has definitely fallen in with the wrong crowd. Inko sobbed, and Tsukashi awkwardly rubbed circles on her back as they waited for her to calm down. What am I going to do? He's my baby! We know, Mrs Midoriya, Nezu said softly, which is why we need your help. Izuku has connections to some very powerful villains, and if we aren't careful, a lot of people could get hurt. Inko sobbed again, and Tsukashi tried to ignore the guilt he felt. We're going to need your help, Mrs. Midoriya. 
Can you tell us if Izuku has his own computer? Maybe a laptop or a PC in his room? Inko nodded. He has a laptop. I hardly goes anywhere without it. When did he get it? Nezu asked. He bought it on sale about a year and a half ago, Inko sniffed. Tsukashi caught Nezu's eye. That was about when Mastermind had stopped using internet cafes. Mrs. Midoriya, Nezu said. We need you to do something for us. We need you to put this notebook back where you found it, and don't tell your son that you read it or that you spoke with us. Can you do that? Inko looked up at them with wide eyes. But, but he's my son. I need to talk to him about this. Mrs. Midoriya, Tsukashi said earnestly. If your son notices anything suspicious, a lot of people could be in danger, including you. We know that it will be difficult for you to lie to him, but it's what we need you to do to keep a lot of people safe. Inko sniffed again. Are you sure this is the best way? We believe it's possibly the only way, Nezu responded. Inko nodded. Okay, if you're sure, I'll do it for Azuku. There's just one more thing we need from you, Mrs. Midoriya. Nezu said. If your son ever leaves his laptop at home, wait until you're sure he's gone, then call us immediately. We wouldn't ask you if it wasn't important, Tsukashi added. Mum, did you clean my room? Izuku yelled, so his mum could hear him in the kitchen. There was a long moment before she responded. Yes, baby, I noticed you've been stressed lately, so I thought I'd do something to cheer you up. Izuku glanced at his desk and sighed with relief when he saw his mastermind notebook hadn't been moved. Thanks, Mum. You're the best. Chapter 42 Target-Rich Environment Mum, do you want me to pick you up anything while I'm at the mall? No, baby, Inko said nervously. I'm good. Have fun. Izuku smiled at her before closing the door and walking towards the train station. Inko let out a breath of relief. Yes. It had been just over a week since she found his notebook, but it had been the hardest week of her life. She just wanted to lock him in his room and keep him safe. But the detective said that there were more people in danger than just her son, so she had to do the right thing, no matter how difficult it was for her. She peeked out the window and saw Izuku walk around the corner, then hurried to his room. Sure enough, there was a black laptop bag sitting by his desk, she opened it and pulled up the laptop before grabbing her cell phone. Detective Tsukashi, you told me to call if Azuku ever left his laptop at home. As Azuku walked from the train station to the mall, he wished his friends were able to go with him. Wasn't going to the mall something you were supposed to do with your friends? Too bad the League of Villains would be attacked on sight. But maybe he could pick them up a few things. Azuku had just been looking for an excuse to get out the house, truthfully. Mom had been acting kind of strangely recently, probably because society was changing so much, and she always was a worrier. But it made for an awkward atmosphere at home, and today was Saturday, so Azuku had figured he'd go to the mall and get his mind off things. He'd heard rumours that villain merch had become more popular recently, and he was excited to see how the stores were treating their Hawks collections now. Apparently quite a few stores had stopped selling it, since it was obviously qualified as villain merch now, but those that continued to sell it were apparently doing really well. Hawks had decided not to change his name or aesthetic when he went villain, because he wanted people to remember where he came from. There'd apparently been a mass burning of his merch the day after their attack on the commission, but Darby had kind of ruined the spirit of it when he'd shown up to light the pile on fire. Shoto had texted him pictures of it while laughing his ass off. Izuku felt a tinge on the back of his neck, as if someone were watching him, and he glanced behind him, where... Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed Tsukashi stop and look at a shop window. Had... had Tsukashi figured him out? He couldn't have. Could he? Izuku kept walking towards the mall, and Tsukashi always kept just a block or two behind. He took a deep breath. Tsukashi couldn't touch him, even if he'd figured out Mastermind's identity, not without risking the lives of the country's top heroes. Izuku was still safe, so... There was no reason for him not to have a little fun with the detective. When he reached the mall, Izuku turned and smiled as he caught Tsukashi's eyes. He saw a look of fear pass over the detective's face as he opened the door. The poor guy was probably terrified because of how many hostages would be available once he got inside. Yeah, 
The mall was a target-rich environment, but Izuku wasn't planning on causing any chaos today. That might change, depending on what Tsukashi did. But for now, Izuku was content to simply tease him. What do you mean my son is mastermind? Inko asked shrilly. You... you just said he'd fallen in with the wrong crowd. We are deeply sorry for deceiving you, Mrs. Midoriya, Nezu said. But we did not believe you'd be able to continue acting naturally around your son if you knew. You must understand how important it is for us to get this right, since Mastermind is not in the business of giving second chances. But... but my baby! Inko crumpled to the floor, and Nezu motioned for some of the officers to comfort her as he opened the laptop, his paws flying across the keys as he began to hack his way through the password. Tsukashi kept his distance from Midoriya as he wandered them all. He wished he could give the order to evacuate, but he couldn't let Midoriya realise how close they were to catching him. He almost had a heart attack when he'd been spotted, but Midoriya seemed to think he was untouchable, which, at the moment, he was. So Midoriya seemed content to just rub his invulnerability in Tsukashi's face as he wandered them all, sometimes standing a little too close to an ignorant salesperson in clear display that he could kill any of them at any moment, and Tsukashi couldn't do anything about it. Tsukashi? Nezu's voice ran over his earpiece. I managed to find the program, but it might take a while to disable it completely. Do you still have eyes on Mastermind? Yes, Tsukashi said quietly, pretending to look at some shirts. He knows I'm here, but has decided I'm not a threat. I'll let you know if that changes. I've got backup waiting for my signal. I just can't wait for this to be over. I agree, Nezu said. Good luck. I'll work as quickly as I can. Come on, Ashida whined. Stop being so depressed. We're out here as a class to distract ourselves from the world crashing down around our ears. Yeah, well, last time we went out as a class, we ended up running into a pair of supervillains, Shinzo grumbled. Or did you forget about that disaster? And the time before that was a week before Todoroki got kidnapped, Kaminari added. At least Bakugo was able to come with us this time, Kirishima said cheerfully. Only because Aizawa gave up, Sue pointed out. You can't keep him cooped up for not having a license if nobody has licenses anymore. We still have our licenses, Yayurosi said. Just because the Hero Commission that gave us our licenses isn't around anymore. Let's be honest, Siro said. Right now, we're all vigilantes, and nobody cares that Bakugo has anger management issues because that's pretty standard for illegal heroes. Even after they sort out the licensing thing, we're never going to be popular anyway. The world is eclipsed in darkness, Tokiyami said softly. Oh, stop it, Jiro said. You didn't even have that much to be sad about, Tokiyami. You were going to be underground hero anyway. The rest of us had to completely reevaluate what our careers are going to look like. Or did you forget that Mineta and Aoyama dropped out as soon as they realized heroes weren't going to be famous anymore? Please stop arguing, Ida pleaded. We are UA students. We should give an example during these dark times. I think that stopped being an option when one of our own turned villain, Shinzo said. Shut up, losers, Bakugo yelled. Are we just going to complain the whole time, or are we actually going to do something? Yeah! Uraraka looked determined. This is a mall, after all. Sato shrugged. I'm kind of hungry. We could stop by the food court if you guys want. Anybody opposed to that? Yayurozu asked. Everyone shook their heads. Better than sitting here all day, Bakugo rumbled. Kachan? They all whipped around to see a green-haired boy around their age staring right at Bakugo. Azuku had made eye contact with Tsukashi before deciding to approach 1A. What better way to rub Tsukashi's own helplessness in his face than to surround himself with heroes? He knew he was probably having too much fun, but he couldn't resist. It was turning out to be a pretty great Saturday. What are you doing here, Deku? Bakugo growled. Azuku smiled sweetly. Shopping, Kachan, same as you. Kachan? Ashido squealed. That is so cute! Shut up, raccoon eyes! Ah, so Kachan gave you a nickname too, Azuku said. Oh, is Deku not actually your name? Uraraka asked. No, my name is Azuku Midoriya. Deku's just what Kachan calls me to make fun of me. Hey, at least it's better than soy sauce face. Siro laughed. Hey, since you already know Bakugo, Uraraka asked, why don't you join us? That's a wonderful idea, Yayurozu said. We're about to get something to eat. I wouldn't want to impose, 
Izuku said, knowing that would only make them try harder. Nonsense, Ida said. Any friend of Bakugo's is a friend of ours. I'm not friends with this loser, Bakugo exploded, but the class just ignored him. Yeah, Ashido said. How long have you known Bakugo for? Do you have any juicy stories of him as a kid? Well, um... Don't answer that, Deku! Ooh, Kaminari grinned. That's a yes. Come on, guys, Jiro said. We've got to get a table before it gets too full. Tsukashi watched as Midoriya interacted with 1A, who had no idea how dangerous he was. If Midoriya was trying to torture him, it was working, because it was getting harder and harder not to just arrest him on the spot as he got his food and went to sit with 1A, who had pushed several tables together in the centre of the food court. He leaned against a wall, no longer pretending to shop, just trying to look natural as he waited for the signal. Any luck yet? he whispered. Not yet, Nezu responded. The Brava is really quite good at what she does, but I'm close. Wait, is that Detective Tsukashi? He froze and saw Ashido waving at him. Hey, Detective, come say hi! What should he do? On the one hand, getting closer to Midoriya before he was cleared to make an arrest was risky, but on the other, it would raise more red flags for him to ignore the greeting. Midoriya smiled at him and raised an eyebrow in challenge, and Tsukashi walked hesitantly towards the table. Ashido, stop bothering the detective, Ida scolded. He might be on duty. Tsukashi forced himself to laugh. That's all right, I'm not busy. Well, then why don't you come sit with us, Ashido said. Midoriya, this is Detective Tsukashi. He talked to us a few times when we've had run-ins with the League. Tsukashi, this is Izuku Midoriya, one of Bakugo's old friends. We've met, Tsukashi said stiffly. Oh yeah, Midoriya smirked. I'd say the detective knows me pretty well by now, don't you? If the others noticed the tension, they must have decided not to mention it. Tsukashi forced his hand away from his gun as Midoriya enjoyed his obvious discomfort. He took a deep breath and forced himself to relax. The detective was tense, which was kind of the point, but... Izuku narrowed his eyes. It almost seemed like the detective was waiting to make his move. But that was too risky. His program was... on his laptop. Which was at his house. Fuck. Now it was Izuku's turn to act calm. He sent a quick text to Shoto, telling him he loved him and instructing him to look in the box under the couch in his apartment, then deleted the text. Izuku put his phone back in his pocket and laughed at the stupid joke Kaminari had just told while eyeing Tsukashi. Considering how long Tsukashi had been following him, and assuming Nezu already had his laptop, he'd probably be getting the go-ahead to make an arrest any second now. His phone started buzzing in his pocket, but he couldn't risk pulling his eyes away from Tsukashi. Could he even get out of this? Tsukashi noticed a shift in Midoriya's behaviour, and mentally pleaded for Nezu to speed up. If they didn't make the arrest soon, Midoriya might run. God knows the kid had enough resources and connections to make himself disappear if he wanted to. I beat the programme, Nezu said. Make the arrest, now! Uraraka didn't know exactly how it happened. One moment they'd been laughing at something Kaminari said, and the next, Midoriya was holding a knife to her throat as Tsukashi pointed a gun at them. Whoa! Kirishima yelled. What the heck, guys? What's going on? Tsukashi didn't look away from Midoriya. Drop the knife, Midoriya. We found the program and disabled it. We aren't going to let you get away again, so just give it up. Izuku tilted his head and shifted the knife so it was pressed even harder against Uraraka's throat. Are you really willing to let a budding future hero die? Just to catch me, Tsukashi? Aren't you supposed to be one of the good guys? Tsukashi's face hardened. I'm afraid you don't quite understand your situation, Midoriya. He shifted the gun minutely, so he was aiming at Izuku's head. I am prepared to take the shot, and these are all hero students who all have the necessary first aid training to keep Uraraka alive long enough to get her to a hospital. You are leaving here in handcuffs or a body bag, but those are your only options, so choose wisely. Izuku tightened his grip on the knife, but he could tell by the look in Tsukashi's eyes that he wasn't lying. If he got arrested, there was no question he'd be going to Tartarus. But if he died, then... Then it was over. No second chances. No saying goodbye. Nothing. He couldn't do that to his friends. He couldn't do that to his mum. He couldn't do that to Shoto. 
Azuku sighed and dropped the knife, raising his hands above his head. Uraraka ran over to her friends, crying, as Yukashi kicked the knife away from him, forced him to the ground, and wrenched his hands behind his back. Azuku Midoriya, you are under arrest for being the villain known as Mastermind. Chapter 43 Why Nezu handed Tsukashi the results of the test. Midoriya's IQ is 205, which is on par with mine. We already assumed he was a genius, but this simply confirms it. Tsukashi sighed in relief. I can't believe it's finally over. We've been trying to catch him for so long. You did a good job, detective, Nezu said. It's because of your hard work that Midoriya is behind bars now. He can't hurt anyone else. The two looked through the glass into Midoriya's cell. The walls were lined with quirks oppressant to make sure none of his allies could try to rescue him, but Midoriya himself was free to roam around inside. He was currently laying on the bed, staring at the ceiling. Are you sure you want to do this? Nezu asked gently. Tartarus does have psychologists who could have this conversation. Tsukashi shook his head. I have to know. Nezu nodded. All right. We're ready. The guard nodded, and Midoriya sat up and moved to a chair facing the window as the glass cleared. Well, detective, to what do I owe the pleasure? We want to know why, Sikashi said. You're going to have to be more specific, detective. Why what? Why did I become a villain? Why did I get caught? Midoriya smiled. Or are you more interested in why I killed your best friend? Tsukashi jumped to his feet. You bastard! Calm down, Tsukashi, Nezu said, laying a hand on Tsukashi's arm. And Midoriya? We're honestly interested in all of them, but let's start with why you became a villain. Your mother told us you had your heart set on becoming a hero at one point. With your intelligence, you could have done well. Midoriya's face twisted in grief momentarily, and he quickly schooled his expression into one of disdain. I don't know if anyone's ever told you, Principle. But the quirkless can't be heroes. In fact, the quirkless can't be anything. According to society, the only thing we can be is forgotten. You could have proved them wrong. Midoriya smiled. I think I already did that. So, that's what this is all about, Tsukashi growled. All those people you killed, just to prove a point about the quirkless? I wasn't trying to prove anything, detective. Midoriya glared at him. I just wanted people to see me for who I was. Give me a fair chance. Was that too much to ask? Villains don't care about if you've got a great quirk, as long as you've got the skills to back it up. You want to know why I became a villain? It's because it was the villains who gave me a chance to shine, while the heroes were too busy making sure I knew my place. I'm sure not everyone was so bad, Nezu said. Surely there must have been someone willing to give you a chance. Midoriya chuckled humorlessly. You'd think so, wouldn't you? But no. My best friend became my bully, and even after he told me to jump off a roof, he was welcomed into UA with open arms. I was abused by my peers for years while the teachers watched, so it came as no surprise that I bear more scars from my childhood than I do from my villainy. I didn't want to become a villain at first, you know. But the world didn't really care about what I wanted. If you think I'm lying, why don't you look up the stats on quirkless unemployment? The world doesn't give kids like me a chance. They don't give people like Shoto or Hawks a chance either. I'm honestly surprised more of us don't turn villain. The world hurt you, Sakashi said. But that doesn't give you an excuse to hurt it back. Maybe not. Midoriya shrugged and smiled but it sure is a lot of fun. Maybe you were right, Nezu. Tsukashi stood and turned his back to the glass. It's probably best to leave this conversation to the professionals. But don't you want to know why I killed All Might? Tsukashi whipped back around to see Midoriya smirking at him, and he charged up to him. Detective, please stay away from the glass, the guard said. Tsukashi forced himself to take a deep breath and took a few steps back. Nezu looked at him with concern. But Tsukashi shook his head and stared Midoriya in the eye. I met him once, you know. All might. Yes, we're aware. Tsukashi snapped. 
You stabbed him through the heart, remember? No, I meant before that, Midoriya said. I was just a little kid who dreamed about being a hero. My life was hell. Bullied in school. Beaten down at every turn for the crime of dreaming too big. All Might was the only thing keeping me going most days. The symbol of peace. What a joke. But even his existence gave me hope that things would get better. He used to say in interviews that anyone could be a hero. Which meant that my dream wasn't so impossible after all. Midoriya shook his head, a sad look on his face. It all came crashing down when I actually met him, though. He saved me from a villain, just like he was supposed to. But then I asked him if I could be a hero. Midoriya looked up, and Tsukashi had to resist taking a step back at the sheer rage in his eyes. He didn't even care about what other skills I had to offer, just said it was too dangerous for a quirkless kid. Your system, detective creates people like me. You put people into little cages based on their quirks. You did it to me, you did it to Shoto, you did it to Hawks. So what else were we supposed to do when this is the only way for us to be free? What are you trying to say? Tsukashi asked. Midoriya smiled. I'm saying that All Might may have been the symbol of peace, but I am the symbol of freedom. The glass darkened as their conversation time ran out, and Izuku was left staring at his own reflection. He waited a few minutes for Sakashi and Nezu to leave, then walked over to lay on the bed again. It's not like he had a lot of options for entertainment in this place besides thinking. He wondered how Shoto was doing. What had he been doing to pass the time since Izuku had been arrested? Had he managed to find the box that Izuku had left for him? Izuku stared at the ceiling that didn't even have cracks to count. Locked up in Tartarus, the highest security prison in the world. No hope of escape. Good thing he'd planned for this. The end. Hey there guys, gals and non-binary pals. It's Eleanor, and I hope you're having a lovely day today. So, uh... Surprise! I finished Mastermind. I did just sit and like record like the last like what is it nine ten chapters of this in like one sitting I honestly I don't know how I powered through this I literally spent it's literally like 2 a.m now and I started recording probably about 2 p.m like I've just been sat here recording for almost like 12 hours straight but here we are it's done what did you think I, I just can't believe I made it through it this is the longest fanfic I've ever podficed, so I knew this one was going to be quite the undertaking to do, and honestly I'm really proud that I got through it, um, quicker than I thought I would, to be honest, but yeah, what did you guys think of some of the last chapters? I know, you know, normally I just ask you about each individual chapters, but it's been a lot, a lot's happened, um, sure to like, let me know all about what you thought what did you think of the ending do you find it really satisfying I've been waiting to record this final chapter literally since the day I decided I wanted to start doing podfix like this was the first thing I ever did like before I ever started making podfix I sat in my bathroom and read out loud the last chapter of mastermind being like could I do this and I got so excited just like having fun with that and I've been so highly anticipating being able to do this last chapter and it was so fun. I love Izuku just being full unhinged, just like unapologetically a villain now. He's like not having to put on his little innocent act in front of them. He's like, no, I'm here. Yeah, and I killed All Might. And what about it? And what about it? He's dead now sucks to be you <laughs> poor Sukashi he's so heartbroken um but you know like <laughs> at least he finally solved the case Nezu surprisingly devious he was a little sneaky like the way that he pulled that with like Inko I was like mm, that's a bit suspect of you was it not but yeah what do you guys think of the thick as a whole how are you guys doing? Let me know in the comments below. Are you proud of me for finishing this? 
And are you happy to see like a bloody two hour long video in your inbox? Probably. <laughs> we'll see if she manages to explore if I have to split this up. Which, if I do, that would be kind of annoying, but, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, let me know in the comments below. Tell me whatever you want. You know I just love to chat to you guys. Uh, you can also like the video, you know, if you liked it, and to boost my serotonin levels. And subscribe to be notified whenever I make new videos to see whatever the new next series will be. Let me know that in the comments below. If there's another really big fanfic or series that you want me to do, uh, let me know what those are so that I can add them to my list. That Yeah, that is a growing list. I can't lie to you. But I'm really excited for it. <laughs> you can also go ahead and join the Discord server if you want to do that. We have a fun time over there. And you can also find me on Ko-Fi. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, whatever you want. I just like talking to you guys and being able to connect with you. It's a fun time. But I will try not to ramble too much. I mean, to be fair, I think I've earned the right to ramble quite a little bit. But I also don't want this video to get even longer than it is. You've already sat through a lot. <laughs> so I really hope you enjoyed it. But until I see you again, be sure to practice some self-care. Go to bed on time. Don't stay up until 2am recording Podvix. It's probably not good for your health. <laughs> Make sure to be eating your five a day. Take any meds that you need to take. Don't forget them. If you've forgotten them now, now is the time to remind you to do it. And please, please, for the love of all that is holy, drink some water, okay? Or Mastermind is going to come after you. And so am I. Because yes, this is a threat. And I will catch you lovely people. Laters.